Svezda TV and Radio Broadcasting Company presents The Zvezda and Combat Approved TV channels are on air and we are starting this issue in the aft compartment of the boat. And now pay attention to the question, dear viewers, experts in military equipment and weapons, what kind of boat do you think this is? I'll give you a clue. First, the word boat in this case is used in the official sense. And second, to help, we go to the upper deck. And what do we see? We see the blue sky and two huge engines. And we understand that this boat is part of the great Russian aircraft called the B-200. It is the only amphibious jet aircraft in the world. It is to this vehicle that this issue of Combat Approved will be dedicated. Let's say it again. This is a great vehicle. In aviation, there have been and still are many flying boats and a huge number of jet-powered aircraft, but among all of them, only one. The only one combines these two qualities. But this is not only the greatness of the B-200. This is a truly steel bird in the sense that, with outward elegance, the car has incredible reliability and enviable flight characteristics. But it's a boat, a high-flying boat. B-200, high-flying boat. An important point, as you of course know, the Combat Approved program is dedicated to the latest military technologies. The B-200 is operated by the emergency services. The tasks that the rescuers have to deal with are sometimes comparable to military ones, except that here they don't shoot. But the main thing is the B-200 itself. It comes from military developments and those overloads for which the high-flying boat was prepared by its designers the margin of safety that was put into it are almost never found in civil aviation. And thirdly, the release of each aircraft to the plant is controlled by combat approval. So that's our theme, let's go. Combat approved. Above the green sea of the Tiger, it is not fog, but smoke from fires. Dozens of square kilometers of burning forest. Fire trucks will never get here. The only way to extinguish it is from the air with the B-200. A bright spot on the screen of the thermal imager is the epicenter of the fire, where it does not smolder, but burns. The plane goes to the target and the hearth is covered with a veil of man-made rain. It may seem that this is just a drop of water in an ocean of fire, but after dropping the water, the B-200 is not sent back to base, but to the nearest lake. On the move, it fills the tanks and again back to the burning tiger. And like that, day after day. This is not exercises and not demonstration performances, but documentary footage of the heroic everyday life of flying firefighters of the Emergency Services Ministry and their unique flying fire truck. One month until hot July, the beginning of summer 2021. Combat Approved is at one of the aviation rescue centers of the Ministry of Emergency Situations in the south of the country, in Rostov-on-Don. This is Combat Approved, and we are starting this issue on the territory of the Platov Airport in the city of Rostov-on-Don. Why here? Yes, because based here is, well, in fact, one of the largest, let's not be afraid of this word, groupings of B-200 aircraft. It is clear that each aircraft here is operating in the interest of the Emergency Services Ministry, and right now, one of these aircraft is preparing for takeoff. There are three centers where the Russian Emergencies Ministry has B-200 aircraft based three. in Russia. We're here in Rostov. How many planes are under your command? We have four B-200 aircraft under our control. What tasks do they deal with? The primary task is to extinguish forest fires. Also, in exceptional cases, we can use an aircraft to transport the operational group of the Emergency Services Ministry. But in fact, these are mostly fires. Yes, these are fires. 
There are 12 B-200 planes in the fleet of the Emergency Services Ministry. The registration bases besides Rostov are Krasnoyarsk and Khabarovsk, that is, in Siberia with its endless forests and the Far East, where winged fire trucks may be needed at any time. However, this is a conditional division. The jet engines of our hero make it possible to quickly change the location. Shortly after our filming, one of the flying boats from the Rostov base set off to put out fires in Siberia. And before that, the B-200 planes have been to Indonesia, Portugal, Chile, Israel, Italy and Greece. On such trips, they always work to a tight schedule. Dozens of cycles are done per day. Takeoff, landing on the water, water intake, take off from the water, reaching the target, drop, and so on. We have something similar in store for us today. The B-200 is preparing for takeoff, and we are preparing to film the flight of this great vehicle with the help of our favorite tool, action cameras. Without getting big-headed, it's worth noting that no one has ever filmed on such a large scale with B-200 action cameras before. What is happening right now would be called pre-flight preparation in the Air Force. We call it equipping the plane. We prepare aircraft according to specialities. Specialists in aircraft engines, aviation equipment, radio electronic equipment are engaged in preparing the aircraft for flight. And now your attention. We will show you the main weapon. As we are told, this aircraft is not a military aircraft, something without which the B-200 would not be the B-200. This... This is the water intake device, the so-called buckets. There are just two of these buckets, on the right and on the left. Now think about it, in 15 to 20 seconds through these small holes, up to 12 tons of water enters the aircraft. That's 12,000 liters. It's all about speed. During the intake, the B-200 is traveling at speeds of up to 195 kilometers per hour. Why? That's right, because the bottom of its fuselage is a boat. So, you are also sailors? Yes, we are also sailors at the same time. Now, if we have a ship, then the ship must have a steering wheel somewhere. Does this steering wheel exist? Well, here we have a water jet. Really? This tiny little thing? So we continue to examine this aircraft. And I found an interesting thing on it here. To be honest, at first, I thought they were heat traps. These are signal flares to be fired by the crew in the event of radio communication signal failure to ground services using certain code. Meanwhile, preparations for the flight continue. A special machine compressor pumps up the chassis. We're not using air as we're used to doing in cars, but using nitrogen. Due to this, the pressure in these powerful aircraft tires is much less dependent on air temperature. In parallel, preparation for the flight is carried out in the cockpit. Here you see the work of a specialist in airframe and engines. Now we enter the cabin. Here is a classic test of all systems, navigation systems, piloting systems, radio communications. In a word, it is necessary to ensure maximum readiness for departure. While we have been getting ready, it is starting to get dark outside the windows. But we are waiting for this. After all, we have to check the B-200 and its crew for the very difficult nighttime conditions. sure if the camera is transmitting this or not but we have taken off here very sharply now it just feels like we're lifting off the ground and pay attention to the sky what a roll the bank is so steep that it feels like we are starting like a fighter it is important to note this is not a demonstration flight organized specifically for combat approved. We are presenting the scheduled training of the B-200 crew on night piloting. To maintain skills and training, such flights take place regularly. But the B-200, like the rest of the firefighting aviation, still performs its main task, fighting fire, moreover with fire that threatens settlements during the day. 
So why is it important to use fire planes and helicopters? Is it really impossible to get by with simple, familiar ground transport? As a rule, fires occur in mountainous areas, where people can neither reach or get there by car. Plus, there are crown fires, that is, the tops of trees are burning. And for this, you can use only either... So crown fires can only be extinguished by planes? You can also put out a helicopter. Well, by planes, helicopters, that is, it is almost impossible to put out ground means. Let's take a closer look at the arsenal of flying firefighters as well as the advantages and disadvantages of different methods. Option one, the Il-76 aircraft. In a single moment, it can dump 42 tons of water on the fire. Once I was lucky enough to try this technology on for myself, Right before your eyes, pilots of military transport aviation poured 42 tons of water onto a film crew standing next to a fire, and the fire was put out. However, there is one drawback. The plane can only be refueled at the airport, where the required volume of water still somehow needs to be delivered. Organizing a continuous carpet bombardment of a fire is not an easy task for an Il-76. The second option is the Mi-8 helicopter. Here, much less water can be discharged, but this discharge will be targeted and more accurate. This time, Boris Simin, a correspondent for Combat Approved, acts as a test subject. The main goal of today's exercises is to train the accuracy of discharging water to the source of the fire. We are setting up a small fire and, oops, we call water on ourselves. We follow safety precautions. I put on a helmet in case the guy suddenly brought some fish along with the water. Three tons, three tons of water will be in the heli bucket and accordingly will be dumped on this place. We hope they hit the spot. A heli bucket is essentially a portable reservoir with a valve for discharging, which is lowered overboard by the Mi-8 through a special hole in the bottom of the helicopter. It seems to be a simple technique, but here there are so many subtleties which, without understanding, flying with a heli bucket for a helicopter can become lethal. It is attached to the external suspension of the helicopter, to the lock for attaching the external suspension. Further, it has its own design, its own heli yard, up to 28 meters long. Well, then the capacity of the spillway itself goes further. Accordingly, the attachment points are quite simple, but reliable. Now, how hard is it to fly the helicopter with something like this hanging underneath? Controlling the helicopter is not difficult. The only thing is that at high outdoor temperatures, well, and accordingly, the mass of the cargo, which, when the container is filled, the container is filled with water, leads to the fact that the aircraft is operating flat out. So thus the aircraft collects water, lifts off, and continues towards its goal. The discharge of water is about to start. Three tons are flying straight at me. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Oh. Well done. They hit the spot. Bullseye. But you need to understand that you need to understand that you can't put out a fire like this out first time, but an exact hit. Well done, guys. Another advantage of the helicopter, once it has dropped the water, the vehicle can immediately go off for the second round. How close do you get to the fire? Depending on the source of the fire. Certainly close. The only restriction is that we do not enter a smoky area. That is, when flying, to put out fires, like forest ones. So the engines don't choke? That's right, sir. Well, take two. Three tons of water was not enough to put out our fire, although the first hit was accurate. So three more tons of water are flying right at us. I repeat, this is an exercise in precision. The fire's out. 
You have seen all the advantages and disadvantages of this extinguishing method yourself. The pros, precise accuracy and fast delivery of water to the point of fire. Cons, a large fire cannot similarly be put out. You will not reach far into the depths of the burning tiger by helicopter. And this is where the B-200 flying boat comes into play. Now, clearly all fires are different. Each fire is different. But if we take the average fire in the mountains... In a day he can do about, well, about 10 water discharges there, for example, with refueling. The B-200 can take up to 12 tons of water in one run. 10 discharges is 120 tons, three times more than the IL-76. But after all, the IL-76 can make several visits in a day. So in terms of performance, these two machines are more or less equal. However, the B-200 can take in water by itself from the nearest body of water, from a lake or even the sea but the IL-76 still needs a hose with water at the airfield. So imagine we're in flight, we approach the source of ignition, the doors open and streams of water come out from here. The streams are out, the doors are closing. And now another very interesting moment on our command, the doors will open. They open, but it is now being done more slowly. In flight, of course, the open and closing speed is much faster. Faster because the mass of water in the tank still presses on the shutters. As we have already said, water enters the B-200 tanks through two water intakes. There are eight tanks and three options for emptying them. The first, all at once in one gulp. The second, pour two tanks. The third, empty each tank in turn. This is called cutting a clearing with water. It's clear that this is not an easy task to control an aircraft which is at one moment flying above the epicenter of the fire or rushes at 200 kilometers an hour through the water. During one of our shootings, we filmed demonstration shots. The combat approved action camera found itself under the water line when landing on the water. And although the sea is calm, look how fiercely the waves attack the amphibian. In such a situation, a high level of skill is required from the pilot. When we were going to shoot this film, I knew that among the pilots of the emergency services, there were many former military men. And it seemed to me that these former military pilots were military transport aviation pilots. It turns out it's nothing of the sort. They're mostly fighter pilots. Right next to me, what did you fly before? I used to fly Mikoyan Design Bureau aircraft mainly. MiG-21, MiG-23, MiG-25, MiG-31. For the last 10 years, Alexander Markahai has been flying the B-200. The aircraft commander is an instructor. He personally selects the crews of winged fire engines. We have five crews in the link. Out of five crews, we have one transport. The rest are fighters and attack aircraft. Why did the fighter pilots gather here and not from transport aviation? It is my deep conviction that attack fighter pilots are closer to our current work because we practically work at extremely low altitudes on the ground. Attack planes work the same way on the ground. In addition to working close on the ground, the second important quality of attack aircraft is their survivability. These aircraft, like no other, are able to return to base as in the song on the gospel and on one wing. Former military pilot and later Russian Vice President Alexander Rutskoy recalled how one day in Afghanistan a Su-25 attack aircraft dragged a telegraph pole into the air intake. The pilot was approaching the target from above and did not notice that there was a power line and caught a pole. W wait a minute, this is not a joke, not irony, an actual telegraph pole. Yes, I saw it myself. I'm standing at the airfield, looking, what is it? White rollers stick out from there. A telegraph pole. We run up with pilots and technicians. What is this? And he says, Alexander Vladimirovich, I did not notice. They dived. I heard a bang. I looked out from the cockpit. I saw a pole. We pulled out the pole. 
The technicians worked, and in three days this SU was already in service. You show me another plane that will catch a telegraph pole and be in service in three days. The B-200 has almost the same survivability. For it, low-level flight is a regular situation. In the history of this machine, there were cases when the plane hit the tops of trees when extinguishing fires. Even the airframe withstood this. And this is not surprising. The car was originally designed for constant impacts on the water during intake. And these blows are very powerful. It was on Baikal. We got in the so-called ninth wave. The ninth wave is the hidden wave that has the most energy. All waves seem to be the same here, but suddenly there is one wave that has a several times more energy than all the others, and it usually appears unexpectedly. That's what the situation was. We hit it once. Were you moving according to the classical scheme of 200 kilometers per hour? Yes, yes, exactly. In principle, everything now, is standard. Now, wait a second. You are flying. You are flying at a standard speed in the region of 200 kilometers per hour, and then the ninth wave hits you. And at such speed, yes, then the wave hits. It happens. You could say we got off with a mild fright. By comparison, the maximum speed of regular ships is 50 kilometers per hour. High-speed boats can race twice as fast, and then 200 kilometers per hour, a collision with a powerful wave and just a slight fright. Such tensile strength was installed in the B-200 by its creators. Taganrog, the Berea of Aviation Scientific and Technical Complex, is the place where flying boats are born. However, before going through the workshops, let's talk about the history of the complex and special place it occupies in our aircraft industry. Not everyone understands, but Taganrog is the de facto capital of hydroplane building in Russia, because here and only here there is a unique platform which on which there's also a full-scale design bureau That's number for the one. development of aircraft and a production serial site. And, number and a flight two. test complex, even a hydro launch, which in principle provides a full cycle of development for the production of seaplane tests. To be clear, aircraft development, production and flight testing are usually handled by three different organizations, often in different cities. In Tag and Rog, everything is under one roof, because the product here is made unique and specific. In the early 1930s, with the development of the Soviet fleet in the country, a need arose for amphibious aircraft. The development was entrusted to the designer Georgi Beriev. His name may not be as well known as the names of Ilyushin, Mikhayan and Tupolev. And that's a shame, because for our hydro aviation, he is the same as Karolev for astronautics. Under the leadership of Beriev, for example, the main seaplane of the Soviet era, the B-12 submarine Hunter, was built. The B-12 is good for everyone, but pay attention to its propellers. Yes, indeed, propeller engines were installed at the time, which in modern conditions no longer provide what a modern seaplane requires. On the B-200, jet engines are already installed, which allowed it to become such a unique aircraft. As we've said, the civilian B-200 comes from military technology. In the mid-1990s, the most difficult time for the aircraft industry, Sergei Shaigu, then the head of the newly created Emergency Services Ministry, took the initiative to build an amphibious aircraft. It was he who then gave life to the project of a flying boat with jet engines. And therefore, until now, the main fleet of those machines is with the same ministry. Now let's imagine this situation. The plane is flying, surrounded by sea, and at the moment it starts to slow down and we stop somewhere in the middle of the sea. And at that moment, our film crew is on the upper deck. Now let me introduce you to the chief designer of the B-200 aircraft. This is Sergei Anatolievich Fursov. Let's imagine that our excursion is on the high seas. 
And what should we pay attention to first? Well, first of all, here you need to pay attention to the layout of the aircraft, to the layout of the engine on this aircraft, because the main task that designers solve when designing a seaplane, an aircraft that can take off and land on water, is to protect the power plant from water ingress. That is exactly why the engines of the B-200, as indeed of the B-12, are located on the top of the fuselage, high above the wings. We ask, what if salt water, the worst enemy of power plants, still gets inside? Now we come to the right engine, not just because we opened its hood, in order to do what? To demonstrate that our aircraft can be operated, including when it is on the water. You see these hatches are open in such way that the aircraft technician can climb. Yes, on these open ones, on the open sash and... So this is provided for by the design? Yes, and it fully supports the weight of a person. And he can carry out some kind of repairs or checks on engine units. It's at the bottom of the engine, and we can climb up. And up, there are certain steps. Now here they have already trained me, they explained what to hold on to. Pay attention, a special step. The technician goes upstairs, and now... He has all the units completely within his reach. So, what would not happen right on the high seas? Well, not everything. If the engine fails completely, it will be difficult to change at sea, but to replace the unit, to conduct some sort of inspection, this is quiet enough. Even ordinary fresh water is an extremely dangerous environment for an engine. The uniqueness of the B-200 is that its creators had to take into account the water factor in literally every detail, without compromising the aircraft's flight qualities. Now, let's take another look at the B-200, not as an airplane, but as a boat design feature. Well, of course, an airplane, since a seaplane does not have a round fuselage, but a boat that allows you to land, take off from water, and maneuver on the water. And there are certain features of this design. Firstly, water loads the structure very heavily. Very large loads come to the structure of the boat aircraft. Now, what exactly could that be compared to? Well, let's say, if we say in a very simple way, let's say at a speed of 300 kilometers per hour, that you land on water or on asphalt, the loads are approximately the same. Seriously? So, when we hit the water like this at a speed of 300 kilometers? Yes, yes. Therefore, of course, the design of the boat is very powerful. It is naturally overweight in relation to conventional land aircraft, but in another way, it is simple. It's impossible. It can be, yes. The second feature you already know, the engines are placed on top. But even up there, these engines must be protected from water, especially the sea. And therefore, our aircraft have some structural elements, such as spray deflectors, yes, which do not allow water at different speeds, with different waves, to get into the jet engines, in order to protect the engine from water ingress and failure. So. If there were no spray deflectors, the water would fly like this. Yes, absolutely right. These spray deflectors primarily work at low aircraft speeds. And we still have other spray deflectors that do not allow splashes to fall on structural elements, because a jet of water at an aircraft speed of 200 kilometers per hour, if it hits the structure with a thick bundle, the structure can collapse. Is that also a splash guard? Yes, absolutely right. That is, they have chosen their position and configuration in such a way as to prevent all this. And now let's take a broader look no longer at our hero and at aviation and the Navy. Let's say that pilots operate on some frequencies, sailors on others. Pilots have some standards of communication with dispatchers and sailors have others. With the B-200, the situation is more complicated. In the sky, these machines live by the standards of the pilots, on the water, at sea. So both those and others must be provided for by the design. By the way, this aircraft, like a ship, must be equipped with an anchor, mooring lines and a life buoy on board. Now we should pay attention to those antennas under my feet. There are especially a lot of them on the B-200 aircraft, and that is no coincidence. 
Well, in principle, on this plane, it is a modern aircraft, it has a modern aerobatic aviation complex, and among other things, it has radio communication equipment, which, yes, is different from ordinary aircraft, because we have a seaplane. It also lands on the water, and it has antennas, which, and radio stations, which are designed to communicate with ships. That is, if there are some fishermen somewhere, I don't know, a barge, a cargo ship, do you get in touch? With them of in the course. Same For way. example, on the keel we have two external lighting lights, which are missing on ordinary aircraft. This is the first light, it's like on ordinary ships. Yes, if the plane is anchored, it shows well in the dark what its position is. And the second fire for emergencies, if suddenly there was, God forbid, a situation, water got into compartments, the plane broke through the bottom, a special beacon turns on there, which signals that there was a water in the compartments. This is also from a purely marine. And here we are already counting on SOS signal and help. The help of ships. So it was not in vain when we said that our plane, is it a ship or a vessel? Probably a ship. It is still a ship and a plane at the same time. We've said a lot about how fires are extinguished with the help of the B-200, but the official name of the project is Multipurpose Amphibious Aircraft, and the main of these goals is to rescue people. And now, probably the most unusual interview in our program, we will conduct a conversation through the glass. Come up here. Hear me? Can you hear what I'm saying? Yes, I can hear you a little. What is the reason for such an unusual shape of the porthole? Well, firstly, it is not a porthole, but a bubble window. As you know, we have a special purpose aircraft, and it was designed among other things, to save people. And the aircraft has operators who, during rescue operations, also carry out a visual search, if necessary, for injured people at sea and on land. This is what happens when victims are discovered. The B-200 with a group of rescuers on board descends into the water, slows down, but does not stop completely, but slows down. Now, right on the move, it will open its doors. Three, two, one, open. In addition to the main function of firefighting, the aircraft has the function of rescuing people on the water. For this, a cargo hatch is provided. There's a rescue boat on the aircraft, the aircraft is splashed onto the water, rescuers disembark, and the rescue operation is carried out. So, right on the go, at what speed can people get out? At a speed of 10-15 kilometers. To ensure a decrease in the speed of the aircraft, the landing gear is released into the water. The engines do not shut down. And that's how we slow down. We slow down. down the plane on the water. A boat is taken, rescuers disembark, and people are rescued on the water. Since at the Berea Center the flying boat is not only developed, assembled, but also tested, a fully-fledged training stand has been built here, simulating the flights of the B-200. Future crews learn how to pilot it here. Here, amphibians are also tested for strength, including at limiting conditions. You are here with Combat Approved. We are now at the B-200 aircraft simulator. Berea's leading test pilot is sat right next to me. We are now taking off in the plane, and now we will demonstrate one of the most difficult modes, flights in the mountains, when the plane at certain moments will fly exactly like this at an angle of 90 degrees, a roll of 90 degrees. Now, have you ever experienced this yourself? Yes, more than once. When performing the fire extinguishing mode, when performing demonstration flights. Test pilot Yurasov had to pilot the B-200 both in mountain gorges and in the smoke of fires and in the turbulence of thunderstorm fronts and with a pitch of 60 degrees. That is, when the nose of the aircraft is turned up so that the car goes almost vertically, and what is surprising, the clumsy-looking B-200, the symbiosis of an aircraft and a boat, can withstand all this. And Yurasov personally saw with just what sincere respect our seaplane is treated abroad. 
Last year, we flew all the CIS countries were present. Georgia was there, Ukraine was there, there. Who else was there? There were guys from the Baltics. Great relationship, nothing at all. And how do people in the world generally react when you fly to other countries on well, this you plane? Know, you know, ordinary people meet us with great respect, love Russia. During the demonstration of our aircraft, they put on the Russian national anthem, although it is banned everywhere, in almost all competitions, as if they were forbidden to perform it. And people, as it were, but we want you to be happy. In which countries is this? At the Le Bourget exhibition. Despite international sanctions at the exhibition, everything is as it was. We fly, we play national anthem. Here, we're flying, and they say, guys, we played the Russian anthem for you while you were flying. Well, that is nice. It puts tears in your eyes, honestly. And this applies not only to France, this year, the B-200 pilots were warmly received by Greece. These shots were filmed there. What are the future prospects of this aircraft? Well, we believe that this aircraft has a huge potential, because there is nothing like it anywhere in the world. Everything else is presented. It has an extremely limited possibility in terms of application. At the moment, the need for these aircrafts in Europe is colossal. In fact, this is quite a unique story. A Russian civilian, not military aircraft, is ready to be torn off your hands, as they say, abroad. In this matter, demand exceeds supply so much that UAC and Rostec are planning to create a specialized squadron of B-200 aircraft that could be involved in extinguishing fires around the world. Not all countries have the opportunity to buy such aircraft, but many people want to rent them together with a crew with experience in firefighting during the hot season. We are considering the possibility of up to 10 aircraft of the squadron so that they fly all year round and put out fires. While in summer they will work in the northern hemisphere and in winter respectively, in our winter they will work in the southern hemisphere where there's also a large number of fires. And this is not some kind of distant prospect but it should appear in no time at all. Well, we really hope that the production of aircraft under the squadron will start this year. It turns out that an unparalleled amphibious jet aircraft, having been born during the harsh era of the 1990s, is only just now beginning to live. It's just unleashing its potential. Here it is, the real success story of the B-200, a high-flying boat, an aircraft we should be proud of.